just we, we don't want to keep you here longer than, than expected. No, it's fine. I mean, I, I budgeted something around 45 minutes. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah. I can stay for until, um, like, for the whole hour, basically. 45 minutes is okay. Uh, we're going to have maybe 10 minutes of questions. Okay. Perfect. Okay, thank you. Pero hay un eco, ¿no? Fue nosotros preguntamos. And you're seeing my uh, my slides. Um, yeah, responsible thinking and operational framework. Right, but this is this is actually in. Um, you're not seeing my presenter mode. You're seeing the actual presentation. Okay, so let me introduce you, uh, oh. Professor. Sure. Hello, everyone. So we will continue our program. We have uh, here our uh, keynote speaker, Mona Diab. Uh, professor Mona Diab is a computer science professor and director of Carnegie Mellon University's Language Technology Institute. Previously, she was a professor at George Washington University, research scientist with Facebook AI Meta, or Mira. Before joining uh, Meta, she led the Lex Conversational AI project within Amazon AWS AI. Her current focus is on responsible AI and how to operationalize it for NLP technologies. Her interests span building robust technologies for low resource scenarios with a special interest in Arabic technologies, misinformation propagation, computational socio-pragmatics, computational psycholinguistics, NLG evaluation metrics, language modeling, and resource creation. Mona has served, served the community in several capacities elected president of SIGLEX and SIG Semitic, and currently serves as the elected VP for ACL SIGDAT, the board supporting EMNLP conferences. She has delivered tutorials and organized numerous workshops and panels around Arabic processing, responsible NLP, code switching, etc. She's a co-founder of CADIM, Consortium on Arabic Dialect Modeling, previously known as Columbia University Arabic Dialect, Dialects Modeling Group. In 2005, which serves uh, as, a, as a world-renowned reference point on Arabic language technologies. Moreover, she helped to establish two research trends in NLP, namely computational approaches to code switching and semantic textual similarity. She is also a founding member of the SEM conference, one of the top tier conferences in NLP. Mona has published more than 250 peer-reviewed articles. So, not to say more, uh, I give the microphone to Professor Mona. So, let's thank her with an applause. <clears throat> Thanks a lot for the uh, generous introduction. I really appreciate it. I appreciate it, uh, especially I, I, would, I would have loved to be there with you in Mexico City, but unfortunately, I was traveling a lot and I came down with a little bit of a cold. So, um, and I, I do apologize for my voice. Um, I hope it's not COVID actually at this point. Um, so yes, I'd like to share with you some thoughts around responsible thinking, which is a coin, a term that I've coined, <coughs> which response, which comes from responsible AI. But essentially, how do we operationalize such terms and such uh, concepts? Um, oops, here we go. So before I start, I'd like to express my gratitude to all my collaborators over the years for students, interns, residents, and colleagues. Uh, the forthcoming presentation wouldn't have been possible without their rich work and contributions, as well as my advisors and mentors over the years. Thank you very much. And I do apologize ahead of time for my graphics. Uh, I don't have very good color choices, um, but you know, you live with what you have. Um, so there have been huge advances in the area of natural language processing. We're living through the golden age. We devised practical and usable solutions, especially by lay people uh, using NLP technology. So think about Siri, Alexa, Google, machine translation, automatic speech recognition, optical character recognition, large language models. These are all fruits of our technologies of natural language processing and computational linguistics. Um, and from my perspective, from a utilitarian perspective, Thanksgiving dinner, which is typically this, um, as everybody knows what Thanksgiving is, Around the table, we, I have my family is really a melting pot. I'm uh, I'm Egyptian, married to a Tunisian. We speak different dialects of Arabic. We have Hindi friends, Cantonese friends, German friends. Actually, my brother-in-law, my brother is married to a German, and my 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 own family is Egyptian Arabic. 
So typically we rely on Google Translate or rely on my little nephew to, to provide translations. So in order to have a joint conversation. But also these new technologies um, are used and uses emerging, especially for the large language model based generative AI. So basically this talk could have been generated by, you know, by giving me alternative narration choices for um, uh, using a, a large language model. And even now we have text to slide generation, probably better graphics than images and colors that, that I would have used. But always, I, I have to say from, I, I, and this is a biased view, <clears throat> natural language processing has always been very impressive, but I thought it was always our secret and about enabling big tech. But now it's becoming disruptive and it's gone mainstream. So believe it or not, you know, it's making the first page of Guardian, of top, uh, not top pages in New York Times. And in fact, my own dentist wants my opinion if he should use and trust LLMs on treatment strategies for me. And I told him not to. I'm kind of scared of that. <clears throat> it's becoming, especially large language models have become pervasive. They're really proliferating all kinds of technologies. And they come in different flavors, as you know. So Google has introduced BARD. Uh, we have OpenAI with ChatGPT. We have Bing that's being powered also by OpenAI technologies. And it's becoming extremely, extremely useful for people working in the field, even of software engineering, think of Copilot and so on. So it's it's becoming a really large, um, uh, it's almost becoming ubiquitous in our technologies in general. So they've made a huge impact. Large language models have made a huge impact. They're allowing for the development of sophisticated artificial intelligence applications, especially within natural language processing. They're revolutionizing the way we interact with the world around us, but they're also unlocking unprecedented scale of services and systems spurring economic growth. So in a way they are impacting all kinds of aspects of our lives and our professional lives. And they're also having technology, these technologies are having impact on society. There, there's a potential increase for automation with the potential, potential um, for creative expression and efficiencies. But um, they also have the potential to create a better, more equitable society. But there's also some aspects of this that are kind of scary around privacy and societal challenges. <laughs> So what is the state of the union for large language models? There's a fierce competitive scaling race. So everybody who's following this literature would know that there's a million, there are uh, several of these that are out there already like ChatGPT, Llama, Bard, Claude. The adoption and convergence rate. So just for perspective, Netflix, it took them 10 years to reach 100 million users. ChatGPT took them two months to reach the 100 million users. So that tells you like how pervasive and how you know, um, rampant this, this technology has become. It has an impact on environment, the scale of the required compute. It's cost prohibitive. So according to the records, some people mentioned that chat GPT, especially GPT-3 cost $4.5 million and GPT-4 was almost, according to some, um, you know, forecasters in the $2.6 billion range, which is really, really cost prohibitive. So this really reflects the stark difference between the haves and the have-nots. And when we question also where is the role of academia, let alone non-Western, non-US, Silicon Valley, West Coast voices in this, in this technology. Um, so this, these are some of the things that I'd like to address today. But with great power comes great responsibility. So there are huge advances with truly disruptive technology changing the NLP and AI narrative research and product landscape, which is definitely being seen right now. It's extremely accessible, fluent, and intuitive. Basically, it garners trust almost immediately. But there are some problems. It's overconfidence. Large language models are overconfident. They hallucinate. They have a lot of misinformation and disinformation, actually. They, are, they give you the potential to propagate disinformation and fake information. There's a lot of bias. And there's instinctive anthropomorphization, which means, basically, we tend to think of them as a he or a she. And this is something that I'm also guilty of myself. Like I, I find myself having discussions at home with my family around, you know, chat GPT, he said so, or she said so, depending on the day of the week. But essentially we tend to assume, assume that they're kind of almost human. So we're at an inflection point. So there's some open questions. What and where and how regulation guardrails need to be placed? And how do we ensure the veracity of large language models? 
factoids versus opinion data, provenance versus confidence. Who and which ethical value system should be part of this built up or the development of these language models? Even if identified, where and how can it be incorporated? What about cultural awareness and sensitivity within and across cultures and languages? And unfortunately, to date, most of the way we've, the, the actually typical approach towards building these large language models has been around, you know, dumping the web data into the large language model data, training data. And assuming that we have a true reflection of cultural even linguistic diversity, which is not the case. The web and the internet in general is not a reflection of cultures of the world or languages of the world for that matter, in terms of their digital presence, because the web is also, at the end of the day, it's accessible by a privileged set of people out of the different, you know, maybe the per, it's around 3.5 billion people using the web, but in reality, um, you know, that doesn't have equitable representation of languages. And what about multimodal foundational models? Do they help mitigate or exacerbate some of these problems? Could we ground um, an, in modality, so to speak? So we create some kind of translation there. So these are some of the very interesting questions around generative AI and specifically large language models as a technology as it stands today. I promise you this talk is not gonna be about language models only, but I'm alluding to that because it's kind of the big hype now. So basically, again, back to our original you know, timeline around huge advances in natural language processing, we're living in the golden age. And kudos to our community, but also we have a whole lot of gratitude to be given to technologies that enable us. Think about software engineering, systems engineering, machine learning, hardware, but sciences that also empower us, sociolinguistics, pragmatics, social sciences, cognitive science, statistics, and so on. And domains that leverage us. Think about legal, politics, medicine, finance, and so on. So what is the future of natural language processing? With the mainstreaming of natural language processing, we are at an inflection point in our field. Could we turn this into a diamond era for natural language processing and AI in general? And how can we ensure the longevity of natural language processing sustainability? So this talk is going to focus a lot through on how to envision a future for natural language processing through this lens of responsible thinking. So just to give you a background, a sort of like the status of AI as a field, of course, you simplified. So if we go from the 50s through the late 2022, uh, we had an increase in performance uh, and we wonder whether there's still room for improvement and what tasks and what technologies are we asking the same or different questions? Um, as we go over the years from the 1950s since the inception of our field, um, all the way up to now, we've noticed a, a sharp increase in also compute and data scale. This is the name of the conference, SimBig, right? So it's really about big data. But the efficiencies have gone down, accessibility has gone down, and transparency has gone down. Um, and I think of natural language processing as a proxy for artificial intelligence. So before we used to have uh, you know, more transparency because we had more rule-based systems. And the middle era around the 1990s to the 2010s, we had statistical feature engineering type of approaches, which were semi-opaque. They started getting more and more like dense and more opaque. And then now we're living in an era where we have black boxes. So this is a, ser a serious situation. Um, in general, this was basically because we had these linguistic rules, morphology, phonology, syntax in the field of natural language processing uh, as a proxy for AI in general. Uh, and then in the 1990s, as I mentioned, we had feature engineering, and now we have representation learning, which tends to be more of the black box situation, leading to you know less explicit linguistic modeling, so to speak. So basically, it was a time when natural language processing at the beginning was very much equivalent. So maybe some of you have heard this. So natural language processing was also called computational linguistics, and actually our field and, and our conferences are called, you know, ACL, uh, and NACL, North, North, North American Association for Computation and Linguistics. So we had this sort of like correlate technology that we tend to use interchangeably natural language processing and computational linguistics. But really, NLP is about technology. CL is about the science of natural language processing. So now they're starting to become even more and more bifurcated. So let me just give you an example um, where this was really useful for me as a, you know, from, um, from, from, you know, from a scientific perspective. So in this technological rush, we have been st starting to lose the science. And this is a problem. 
So growing up, I was actually bilingual. I grew up in England. And when I went back to Egypt as an Egyptian, I started noticing that people could not pronounce the P sound. So English P or B, people did not know which one was the right one. Younger me thought people were just lazy. They didn't put enough energy or effort into learning the difference between these two sounds. And this really was prejudice and biased. But really, when I started you know, learning more about phonology and linguistics, I realized that second language learners of Egyptian of English, you know, who come from Egyptian background, or Japanese second language learners who come from a Japanese background, uh, learners of English, I mean, they don't hear the difference between a P and a V, a P or a B, or a V and an F sound, uh, and same thing for Japanese. They can't tell the difference between an L and an R sound, and that's because and Japanese doesn't have many closed syllables. So that was really very interesting for me to realize that it was not really about their apparatus, the way they speak, but rather it's about the, the way the brain works. <coughs> and this insight came from the study of phonology. But really understanding the phonological generalization could lead to better technology. So think about accented uh, automatic speech recognition, expend, accented speech generation, better L2, second language learning educational systems. But crucially, this is really humbling knowledge, making me less judgmental and more empathetic, at least around language. And you can think about this insight could have been derived from data, especially given scale today, hence informed phonology. So there is pattern discovery that could have been generated from the amount of data that we have, which is something that was also synergistic with large data. So back again to our field and its progression. So right now we're living through an era where we have a lot of opaqueness, unpredictability, hallucinations, privacy violations, harmful output, like think about bias, misinformation, disinformation, a lot of inefficiencies. So these are symptoms of what I call uncontrolled systems, where there's this notion, all these attributes. Um, so what is notion of control? Control is being able to control the outcome and the performance and predict it reliably. So reliability is a critical aspect of our systems that we're building today, especially putting it out in the society, putting it out for you know general use. So how can we increase control? And this control has been going down. So as you can see, control was at the beginning when you had rules and small systems, toy systems, you're able to control the, the, the outcome, you're able to predict and reliably know what's going to come out of the system. That's why we like decision trees, for example. But now in the current era, we're actually in this phase where control is really, really completely elusive. So if what's the North Star for AI technologies and NLP technologies is to have them be, you know, by 2030, you know, less data and compute size wise, more performant, <coughs> uh, with more control. But how? What's a good way of doing this? In order to control, we need to infuse guardrails, which come from understanding the underlying phenomena. And we've also recognized that learning by osmosis, which is absolute self-supervised learning, has shown its colors. So think about the creepy chatbots that have been released to the market. We need some prescriptive knowledge infused, identifying what the appropriate prescriptive knowledge and how much of it is an area of research, but also relies on understanding the phenomena, nuances, and contexts. And this leads to more explainable and transparent, transparent models and systems, hopefully. So consider natural, so this is the proposal that I'm making. We consider AI technology as safety critical systems, like think about medical devices and airplanes with more guardrails and regulations that potentially could get us there. And central to critical systems is how to do robust evaluation. So think about red teaming. We need to do root cause analysis and reliable mitigations. And this should all be done in a scientific manner. So it should not be patchwork or ad, you know, ad hoc type of solutions. So what is the future of AI or future of natural language processing is controlled natural language processing. And what are the symptoms of that? They should be safe, accountable, predictable, transparent, private and secure, reliable and efficient. But again, not lose the notion of utility and usability. So this is central to AI technologies and central to NLP technologies. And from that perspective, they need to be trusted and sustainable. So there is a link between utility and usability and trust and sustainability. So here's what I, I'm gonna lay out the case for that. So controlled natural language AI, natural language processing or AI, as I mentioned, they should be accountable, safe, predictable, transparent, private and secure, reliable and efficient. But we've heard these tenets before. They come from responsible AI, or they're very similar to what we see in responsible AI. 
So on responsible AI, we talk about accountability and governance, robustness and reliability, privacy and security, fairness and inclusion, efficiency, transparency, and explainability, and ethical design. So these are all tenets of what we call responsible AI that I believe are very much applicable to our case of the building AI technologies. So what is the framework I'm pr proposing is called responsible AI framework dimensions, RAFE, and it's inspired in a form of many published responsible AI manifestos that come from Meta, Google, MSR partnerships on AI, et cetera. So it has four components. The first one is responsible innovation, which addresses why we produce AI technology, addressing societal impact and human value alignment responsibly. So think about ethical design. Responsible systems addresses what AI technology. This namely covers the research, the engineering, and the products. So think about privacy, safety, fairness, robustness, reliability, explainability, and interpretability. And responsible research conduct addresses how we conduct our research. So development and deployment, accountability, reproducibility, efficiency, traceability, and openness. And finally, diversity and inclusion addresses who our target users are, who the developers are, and the researchers, and the team, for example, think about team makeup, safe meetings, accessibility, and so on. So these dimensions overlap and bleed into one another. So what is a RAVE mindset? It's just the basis for the responsible thinking, which is in the title of my talk. If we are to consider AI technology as critical systems, then we need to produce RAVE compliant technology. So if we reduce the RAVE mindset to a set of um, compliance check marks, then that makes it much easier to figure out whether we're compliant or not. So from that perspective, we're thinking about this from a controllable set of systems. So RAFE applies to both AI performed responsibly by us, as well as applied and deployed responsibly for the user. And RAFE needs to be inherent in our defining, devising, development, dissemination stages of the technology proactively and strategically. So thinking responsibly critically is not an end stage. It is a muscle that strengthens with practice. So what is the current practice? The current practice is many people in our community work on aspects of responsible AI, but mostly desperately. And for the majority, responsible AI considerations are typically an afterthought or optional, only heeded by those who work directly in the space. And mostly confined to ethical and limitations paper sections, if ever present. So we need to change that practice. That's what that's the advocation that I'm putting out here. So why responsible AI for uh, framework for natural language processing or AI? It's really about technology artifacts have huge societal impact. So think about responsible sy systems and responsible research conduct. But also the technology is a need for a generalizable North Star with more, more scientific integrity. So remember my example around phonology, it's basically, it, there's a generalization there that you need to make. And essentially that leads to better systems and more efficient and more explainable systems that we're building. Responsible AI framework ensures human value alignment. So this is a responsible innovation tenet and it emphasizes human centricity through ethical design, therefore ensuring utility and practicality of our technologies, which actually can, is pertaining to diversity and inclusion. And it builds trust. If you if we adopt a RAVE framework, that should engender trust re leading to higher user adoption. So think about technological breakthroughs with enormous potential for benefiting society. They sometimes face barriers to adoption when lacking public trust and confidence. So what is the motivation for adopting RAVE for natural language processing or AI? A framework serves as a guide, creating a space and trajectory for our field, but also a defined framework serves the community as a forcing function to think proactively about responsible AI framework dimensions, explicitly addressing them in our design, like the research questions and the hypotheses. So a benefits of the framework, you know, if you have random brush strokes, no matter how skillful the various painters are, it doesn't need necessarily to the Mona Lisa. But if you have a coordination, then you end up getting a Mona Lisa, hopefully. So is the Mona Lisa attainable? Let's see if empowered um, NLP, RAFE empowered NLP AI can get us there. So what is the objective? RAFE from inception to dissemination. RAFE and the challenge is how to do this at scale. So think about big, large systems. So what are the sometimes the RAFE um, artifacts checklist? So responsible innovation is the purpose of my work, benevolent, addressing considerations and limitations. So this addresses the why. Responsible systems, is my tool model system robust, reliable, safe, generalizable, efficient, explainable, interpretable, sustainable, that addresses the what. Responsible research conduct, do I have full traceability, accountability, compliance, reproducibility, et cetera? This addresses the how. 
And did I address all possible subgroups as team members, target users, et cetera? Addresses the who. So this is a high level responsible AI framework operationalization, which is inspired by meta RRC guidelines. At project inception conception, we think about intended outcomes. Who will use this research? How can you design your project to uphold your intended positive outcomes? Can you consult with others outside of your immediate team? Can you envision potential pitfalls and areas that might be sensitive that have potential for misuse? During R&D, we do data collection. Can you source the data, collect labels from annotators? Can you model, during model training, revisit the ethical implications? If the training data is heavily skewed or a priori, consider exploring mitigations. And at evaluation, look out for any embarrassing mistakes. So these all address the responsible systems, responsible research conduct, and diversity and inclusion. And at dissemination for responsible research conduct and diversity and inclusion, think about how you're disseminating. Are you doing talks, demos, systems, potential harms and benefits? How do you engage with the community? Are you releasing models and code and data? How, how can you ensure that this is transparent? So these are all things that you think about at a high level. So there are some questions to ponder. Is responsible AI framework expensive? So this is a question that is, has, posed, has been posed. It's considered a friction point, of course, and it's current prevalent because the prevalent uh, paradigm is really an afterthought paradigm. And hopefully if we think about RAFE proactively, this would be mitigated. There are some considerations, potential trade-offs between RAFE reliability level versus cost. So things like time to market, depending on the application domain. Who does it, what does it mean for academia? Does this only factor for industry? Um, and if we have full control to be able, then we'll be able to calibrate the level of reliability, hence affecting the cost. So essentially it goes back to this original idea that we have full control over the systems. And ethical considerations might be at odds with profits, but having more responsible AI voices and have, who have internalized the paradigm could tip the balance, hopefully. And basically the last question here, um, or the last of several that I thought about, um, can responsible AI framework inadvertently create tiers among NLP AI practitioners? Um, I don't think this is the case, especially if we take DNI uh, seriously. So just as a reminder, the future of AI and natural language processing is to be trusted and sustainable. And the question is, can RAFE for NLP lead us to this future? So how about walking the walk and talking about this now in practical terms? A responsible natural language processing versus trusted NLP, a responsible natural language processing via sustainable NLP. So I'm gonna give you some highlights here and um, then we can take questions. So a responsible NLP via trusted NLP. So how do I attain trust in NLP technologies? Trust in the purpose, so ethical considerations, so augmenting human abilities versus substituting them. Automated assistant decision-making for sensitive domains, copyright and IP plagiarism, are some of the considerations that we need to take and take very seriously. Trust in the process. Can we build trustworthy development and evaluation frameworks? And then trust in the outcome. Is the outcome safe, reliable, and robust? Is the outcome where needed explainable? Can we think of devising practical accuracies that reflect user expectations? And are we transparent in the way we're disseminating the process and disseminating the, the knowledge that we've um, that we've gained or garnered over the over the building of the technology? So these are all elements from our framework. So there are several commendable efforts in the community. However, there are some loopholes that explain loss of control in current popular scaling paradigm, because now we're really into the scaling paradigm, as I mentioned. So there's a lack of understanding of large models and data for training and evaluation. There's a lack of rigor and annotation processes of evaluation data, training, and development data, which really tells us that we need some kind of an annotation science. So this leads to a lack of trust in the process, but also there's a lack of practical accuracy of metrics that are commensurate with human expectations and perceptions. And there's a lack of reliability and stability of performance. So there's an, a certain level of unpredictability. And there's a lack of transparency. So explainability, interpretability, and openness are also lacking from, uh, from our systems, which leads to a lack of trust in the outcome. So I'll address one of these cases here uh, that I think is relevant to this crowd. So this is large scale tooling around automation is critical for trust in the process. So we built a tool for large scale data characterization and it's called text characterization toolkit. It's basically based on text, but it's, it doesn't really matter what the modality is. And this is published late 2022. 
So what is text characterization toolkit? It's a dynamic lightweight platform and infrastructure that enables easy definition configuration calculation of arbitrary quantitative metrics over large corpora. So literally data at scale. And this is specifically targeting large language model data, training data. So TCT comprises 61 metrics, majority a re-implementation of the co-metrics metrics. And essentially it provides a dashboard to visualize and understand data with respect to defined characteristics. Standardized Jupyter notebook, notebooks and scripts to identify characteristics as captured by defined metrics that influence model performance. Discover correlations between individual characteristics and outcomes, but also fit multivariable regression models to predict model performance based on text characterizations. So what was the motivation for building this? NLP data sets are often treated as homogeneous sets relying on single summary metrics to understand model performance. But large data sets are known to contain biases, artifacts, spurious correlations. So summary metrics fail to surface such aspects. And most available tools for analysis are not easy to use or scalable. And researchers rarely include site insightful breakdowns in their papers because there is a lack of tooling that can go with this. So the objective was to gain more understanding and control over large data by specifically targeting robustness. Thinking, can we characterize sets of texts on which we expect our model to work significantly better or worse? But also from the data selection perspective, can we use text characterizations to select a more representative, diverse set of training examples? So select a more representative training set to increase downstream performance, for example, would be one use case. Select a better validation set so that the perplexity measured at large language model training time could be correlated better with downstream task performance. And also to handle bias, are there characteristics related to protected attributes that result in different performance, for example? So some of the categories of implemented text metrics are descriptive statistics, lexical diversity statistics, complexity, what's called incidence scores, and word properties. So it relies on word property databases compared to the original co-metrics databases. Right now it's only in English, but we provide support for scaling to multilingual data, as long as you have the underlying tools and databases. So TCT in action, what's the current practice? You have a model and data, and you do model predictions, and then you have evaluation metrics, and you iterate on the model, go back and forth. But the data is really kept as is and to a large extent. Now, what we've added with text characterization is essentially adding more characteristics of the data, do some data analysis, iterate on the data, and therefore feed into the model and so on. But going beyond that, we could also understand what's called influence measurements. So we think about model um, extending you know, model evaluation to provide insights about the role of data in your modeling. And I'll show you how this is done in practice. So the, from internals, the text characterization platform has a demo where we have dashboards showing all kinds of aspects of the, of the data and data characteristics and so on. And we show you some linguistic metrics. We show you some characterizations that are more surface level in different, in different visualizations. We also show correlations between text characteristics, model performance with respect to some characteristics, results of regression analysis, <coughs> coefficients and fit, and so on. So I just wanted to show you one use case. We had implemented at Meta this um, large language model that was a multilingual language model that was balanced. It was 7.5 billion parameters. It's called XGLM, and it was published in 2022 at EMNLP. And we wanted to compare the performance of the English section of the multilingual language model to the English only uh, large language models that were built by uh, OpenAI at the time was ChatGPT, 6.7 billion parameters off the shelf. And we had a, our own implementation of it that was a mimicking of that based on the literature that we had access to at the time. And we compared all three. We noted, and this was a very, very strong baseline um, the data sets are known to be very complex. Sorry, Close, Copa, Winogrande, Heleswag, take my word for it. They're, they're the most complex data sets that we have in, the, in our field. And what we noticed is consistently XGLM performed worse than the other data sets, sorry, than the other models. And we were like, okay, what's going on? How come there, it's being beat by, um, by chat GPT models, whether it's our internal, represent, our internal implementation or the one that's off the shelf? on these challenging English tasks. So the research question is, is the downstream performance on English tasks affected by the shift of the language distribution in the pre-training data? So we wanted to confirm this. So we use TCT as an analytical tool, looking at specifically the lexical diversity type token ratio uh, for all words. 
And lo and behold, we found that less called diversity metric, there is more overlap between the GPT-3 training data and test data distributions compared to what we have from XGLM training and test data distributions. So this red curve that you see, the blue curve here corresponds to GPT, um, the chat GPT versus what we have from XGLM. So it basically gave us some insight and interpretability to performance at scale, which was something that we added to our papers, but also was very informative for how to do data selection going forward in terms of building these language models. And of course, alternative evaluation data sets. So the next one I wanted to talk about is practical um, accuracy metrics that are commensurate with user and human perception. So this is about trusting the outcome. So the problem was that we have um, for machine translation evaluation, the metrics that we were using were are typically based on what's called direct um, direct evaluation. And what we tried to do there was actually think about ways of making this more um, more relevant and more akin to the performance that we get to see from uh, our machine translation systems. So what we noted was, um, in general, we had a problem. So basically our internal systems tell us that our machine translation is at 90% accuracy, 80% accuracy, but in reality it's at 25, 26% accuracy for different languages. So think about Thai, think about Burmese, especially for low resource languages. So this was a problem and we were like, okay, why, where is this disparity coming from? What we noted was essentially a lot of the data sets that we had for evaluation contained very generic uh, language, like thank you, happy birthday. And of course we're doing really well on this. So for our internal evaluation, our systems were doing really well, but in reality, we're not doing a really good job because we are, we're not doing good data selection because we didn't have good data characterization, which links to the previous uh, aspect of my talk. So we devised a consistent human evaluation for machine translation across language pairs. So this is based on the notion that people care about faithful machine translation. So users of MT expect exact correspondence between source and target. Exact correspondence entails faithful rendering of the target. So achieving meaning, expression, and usage equivalence with the source while maintaining minimal distance. With no additions, so no, so think about hallucinations, deletions, or egregious substitutions. So beyond translation ease. But what is not is not a judgment on the veridicality or the truthfulness of the content or the provenance. So the Zidorata was to adopt faithfulness as an objective for machine translation which entails creating evaluation metrics that are optimized for faithfulness, building in faithfulness aware models and data sets. So what is the mindset shift here is moving beyond the you know, minimum viable product mindset to adopting a faithfulness mindset goes beyond adequate meaning and fluency to include usage considerations. So think about emotional intensity, level of formality, use of idiomatic expressions, hedging in a message has implications, sarcasm and irony. And this is especially pertinent in social media and opinion data. And the potential is, and basically the potential implications of shifting our mindset is basically we change the way we think about um, approaches to evaluation. And it serves as a forcing function toward building more interpretable models. So we devised this notion of cross-lingual semantic textual similarity, XSTS, which already existed in the, in the, in, in the field. So essentially it was never used as an evaluation protocol uh, for machine translation, but it's really an offshoot from what's called sem semantic textual similarity, STS. The annotators basically in this framework, they indicate the level of correspondence between two strings directly between source and target, no need for a reference translation. And it's basically an established human pr evaluation protocol that was used extensively to measure semantic similarity in the literature. So the, uh, the answer, the annotators, when they're doing the labeling, they answer the question of how similar instead of how good a translation is. And essentially it has a very high inter annotator agreement around 90%, basically, which means that two labelers agree with one another. So what is this rubric? It's a, it's a scaled rubric from one to five. And essentially the first, the first layer in this says if the two sentences are not equivalent, but may be related as pertaining to similar or even different topics, this includes incomprehensible and garbage translations. They judge if it's level two, if the two sentences are equivalent or not equivalent, but share some details, some important information differs. And this is where hallucinations and misleading translations could be sitting actually as part of the guideline. The two sentences are mostly equivalent That's level three, but unimportant details differ. The two sentences are actually almost equivalent paraphrases of each other, but they mean the same thing with no major or minor differences in meaning despite potential differences in expression. 
And number five, which is the highest level of similarity or the highest level of correspondence, is the two sentences are exactly and completely equivalent in meaning and usage expression. So think about the formality level, the style, the multi-word expressions. And this reflects this faithfulness that I mentioned about semantics and pragmatic use. So comparing XSTS, which is this new rubric to direct assessment that I mentioned earlier, in direct assessment, this was the de facto empty established protocol. It has fine granularity of measurement sensitive to both fluency and adequacy, and it depends on human translation as a reference. XSTS has better rater agreement and reliability, no need for human reference translations, and it's faster and less expensive, and it's more objective, meaningful, and simpler. And it also focuses on meaning rather than fluency, so potentially appropriate for current neural machine translation systems, and has better correspondence to human expectations. So XSTS now is the human evaluation metric currently adopted within meta machine translation research as well as product. So this is a nice, a nice thing, but essentially this leads to more trust in the outcome and therefore it's, it's, uh, it's better reflecting what people actually expect. So now I wanted to shift from the trusted NLP. I hope I've convinced you that there is a way to do this in an operational framework. Now I wanted to, to switch over to how to make this sustainable through responsibility. So sustainability of natural language processing is critical. And how what does that mean? So now we ask the question, is it really saturated? Do we need to grow in terms of solution systems, users, researchers, and developers? And I believe in order for us to do this, we need to have diversity and inclusion as a cornerstone of natural language processing growth. And in order to ensure the longevity of the field, we need to heed the impact on the environment. So think about green AI, sustainability. And we need to collaborate with other disciplines within CS, linguistics, and across the campus uh, to, to make our discipline stronger and more resilient, but also help shape policies and regulations that allow our voice to be heard and leads us to shaping the future of NLP. So what are some of the aspects of sustainable natural language processing? It needs to be accessible. And this actually applies to all of AI. I'm just using NLP because that's my field, but essentially this could be applicable to all kinds of AI. It needs to be accessible, reaching more people in various communities and all languages, lowering the entry usage barrier cost in the field. It has to be useful, relevant technology, improving people's lives. And it has to be maintainable, growing community and researchers and developers. It needs to be transparent in terms of the dissemination of knowledge through accountability. It needs to be benevolent. It needs to be for societies avoiding harmful impacts, but also for the environment, lowering the energy footprint, for example, and the cost of use. So these are all aspects of all the uh, the responsible AI frameworks that I had pre presented to you earlier. So how do we operationalize this for a sustainable um, NLP? How can we do this using DNI? <coughs> so why DNI should be a cornerstone of sustainable NLP? Morally, given the utility of the technology, it's incumbent upon us to ensure accessibility and adoption by all people. Otherwise, it's a form of disenfranchisement. Scientifically, DNI serves as a forcing function to think of low resource scenarios, where low resource refers not just to language presence digitally and speakers, but also culture and domain topic and resource availability. And opportunistically and strategically growing our communities by using our technology to make the science accessible, this leads to more inclusion and diversification. So taking NLP, for example, and AI sciences to local communities would be one, one way of doing this. So how to do DNI from a bird's eye view? Users need to have more access, increasing the number of users by lowering the accessibility bar. So think about more efficient systems that could fit on smaller and cheaper devices. So, and basically invest in cross-cultural and multilingual models, unified foundation models, but make them also more efficient. Ensure our teams are as diverse as possible to reflect different viewpoints. And it's not sufficient as it's capped by team capacity, hence the need for attracting homegrown talent to work on natural language processing and AI in local markets to achieve mirroring effects, increasing the global NLP balance. But also increasing our NLP pool by demystification of the sciences, generating scientific materials in different languages, evangelizing NLP and AI through global media, encouraging conferences and outreach programs in diverse locations, especially the global south. So what if NLP is not diverse and inclusive? It becomes an amplification of the global digital divide. Language is politics, a vehicle for culture and communication. And it deprives the field of the rich diversity in cognitive skills, creativity, curtailing the field's potentiality. But more importantly, we would have failed at the mission of catering to all peoples of the world, which is part of the mission that natural language processing has taken on from the, from the get-go. And think about an analogy in medicine science, 
that only caters to the, to and studies and keeps track of white Western European American males, ignoring other races and genders, for example. So what is the North Star? Is like, you know, have NLP practitioners and researchers carrying out NLP research in their local languages. And starting from the top of the funnel, every STEM program worldwide has an NLP component in its local language or an AI component for that matter. So what DNI? DNI are research portfolio, different approaches, avoid fads like deep learning is not all there is. We are a young field still and we can afford to take risks. DNI and our scientific pers perspectives informed by other disciplines, including sibling uh, areas and cousin areas and friend areas. DNI are models and systems, DNI and our teams, and DNI are science knowledge dissemination. So I just want to give you a very, very high level highlight of what I mean by in our models and our systems. So I mentioned our multilingual language model architecture, the few-shot learning with multilingual generative language models. This was published in 2022, where we built a system that had four LLMs of different scales. Uh, similar, it was a causal language model, autoregressive model. It had 30 languages from 16, 16 language families and performed comparable to Anglo-centric Anglo models, especially in zero to few-shot settings. But um, so one highlight is an unsupervised machine translation we were doing really well uh, compared to state of the art in general, especially for low resource languages. And what are the benefits of this? It's energy and maintenance efficiency from an engineering perspective. You know, it's basically you have a single unified model that caters to many languages, basically, you know, relieving our systems from having multiple language, language models. Despite being a single point of failure, it has a powerful incentive of being easier to maintain, access and distribute and track. And such models represent a model a paradigm shift from the Anglo-centric view of the world, um, and is basically able to cater to more languages of the world on equal footing. And paying attention to the design of such models is critical, as it ensures credibility and inclusion, exemplified by attempting to balance language representation. And possessing such lar large language models in different languages can perform well, especially for medium to extremely low resource languages, helps alleviate the burden of creating supervised systems and supervised data for such languages, especially for economically challenged languages. So this is a really good thing. So it's, it basically levels the, the playing field. And having them catering to scarcer language, a language is per scientific research in such languages leading to more diversified NLP and more diversified science in the broader sense. So um, the next thing is about DNI and our teams. And I'm going to go over this in two minutes. We built systems where we're looking at the actual the makeup of the teams. And this was specifically in the, in the realm of doing Arabic NLP. And this was for basically the, the social science, the social social media content annotation, labeling hate speech specifically. And this is quite challenging, especially for um, any language. It's actually across the board that we typically have very low inter agreement because there's a lot of language proficiency that's needed, but also cultural nuance. And especially the problem is, is exacerbated for what we call polyglossic languages, where we have multiple languages sitting side by side in code switch um, settings. So basically the case for Arabic, um, I just wanted to go and say, you know, what we ended up doing, we proved using stratified sampling methodology that we were not doing a very good job with uh, dealing with languages that have uh, multiple varieties because we had our, you know, single um, monolithic team working on this problem. They mostly came from Morocco. So we showed through our technology that in fact, if you have people from the same culture annotate the data, they do a better job. And we showed this using a metric called um, uh, SDT, signal decision theory. And essentially, we, we basically let the, the whole operation within Meta to change where we actually introduce what's called submarketization. So this ensured that we need to have diversity in our teams to reflect the underlying phenomena that we were trying to label or trying to work with. Um, and finally, I just wanted to end here because I realized the time is running out. Um, um, I just want to say that the future of NLP needs to be trusted and sustainable, both are attainable through responsible NLP. I think I made the case for a need for controlled NLP to attain, to attain a trusted natural language processing. Controlled natural language processing emerges from responsible natural language processing. And if we have responsible NLP, that also leads to sustainability and the efficiency and data and diversity and inclusion. Um, and I'm hopefully, you know, the proposal that I'm making around responsible framework 
responsible AI framework for natural language processing could lead to responsible thinking. And I, I provided some direction for operationalizing of this RAFE pointing to gaps, but also I hope I've in, inspired you to think about the future of AI and natural language processing. So for a future outlook, I propose framing natural, future, future NLP as responsible NLP as a broad interdisciplinary enterprise with multilinguality and cross-cultural considerations at the core. Practicalities. Invest and incentivize scaling, scalable tooling and processes, more dedicated tracks in our conferences, a significant efficiency and traceability multiplier. More checklists to make it easier for practitioners to adopt responsible AI framework. Consider low resource language research as a first class citizen in NLP enterprise and establish annotation science leveraging multiple disciplines, sociology, linguistics, psychology, anthropology, and ethics, but also build genuine bridges of collaboration across computer science and sister disciplines. And adjust our NLP curricula to address responsible AI uh, framework, graduating more Da Vinci's who could draw more Mona Lisa's and encourage and support more conferences and outreach programs, especially in the global South. So some take home messages, mainstream responsible NLP in academia, civic society and industry, treat NLP with the rigor of critical systems, adopt a collaborative mindset of DNI, making it core to our enterprise, pro proactively think of responsible NLP from inception to dissemination, and responsible NLP should be the modus operandi for all of us, not just a subset or a track. So the new NLP AI practitioner's mindset should be based on responsible uh, tenets. We don't have to be perfect, but we need to engage and practice responsible AI pro proactively. And again, responsible NLP from a user-centric perspective is the magic bullet that will bring back the science into NLP, explainability, interpretability, ensuring higher scientific integrity in the process, and maybe help us understand human cognition and condition better but also simultaneously build trust with users achieving the goals of NLP, utility for human humans. And this leads to a sustainable NLP via efficiency and DNI increasing accessibility. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, I can't hear anybody. I, I I can't hear you. So your your channel is on mute, I think. <coughs> and how about there? How about here? Can you hear me? Now I can hear you. Yes. Great. Um, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thank you for the for the talk. Um, I have a question regarding sustainability and also reinforcement. Um, of course, many of the algorithms today are claimed to be energetic uh, uh, costly. And uh, so how do we balance uh, between go moving forward in having new results, et cetera, and uh, also respecting um, energy consumption? That's my mm -hmm. first question. And the second question, it is, of course, a proposal of changing the way we practice science. And um, uh, of course, uh, we can decide to do it, but maybe uh, a little bit of reinforcement are enough of by agencies or uh, industry to help also the promotion of this change. What is your opinion about this? So uh, thank you so much for the questions. Um, I completely agree with you. There is an issue of the footprint of our algorithms in terms of the energy consumption and the compute power needed. Actually, it's prohibitive, in fact, in terms of cost. And I'm in the US at one of the richest institutions in the world, and we still are finding this cost prohibitive. We cannot replicate results by industry, for example. There's no way we can do this. And there and there should not be a desire to do this. This is the other aspect, right? Now, because of the, you know, if everybody and their brother ends up and their sister ends up doing this, we, we're going to face a big problem. So we're investing hugely in efficient algorithms and how to enable, you know, uh, technologies that are, have a much smaller footprint. And looking at alternative architectures and looking at alternative ways of doing things so that we have, we're not using the, using the massive data that's needed for these large language models, for example. And, and I'm thinking about the generative AI as charting the paradigm shift that we're having, right? Um, how can we build things that are more deterministic? How can we build neurosymbolic methods, for example? You know, so this is some research that we're doing in my lab around how to, you know, look at static knowledge 
<coughs> the repositories. <coughs> and smart and smarter ways. Sorry about that. So um so yes, so this is the role of academia, I think. And we need to convince industry to invest in that as well. Um, and this is something that we're actually on some sort of a bandwagon to do this. And they, believe it or not, so I had a discussion with Microsoft um, leadership recently, like as recent as three weeks ago, where they came out to CMU. And they're looking for ways of building, you know, more efficient technologies. It's literally costing them, according to them, every two and a half days, the size of a football stadium in terms of compute power to build their language models and power their technologies, which is ridiculously high. So forget about, you know, not even caring about the environment. It's just the cost is so prohibitive for them. And we're talking billions of dollars per week. So it's a, it's a huge challenge. And it's really incumbent upon us as academia, and this is part of the reason I went back to academia, is to actually build the talent that's able to come up with these ideas. Now, the next question around sustainability and uh, not sustainability, sorry, incentivization. I wouldn't call it enforcement because nothing works with force. Um, you know, I would say incentivizing and more carrots than sticks. Um, so one thing that I think is critical, we have lost, I mean, I cut out a lot of pieces from my talk because I talk a lot about scientific integrity. Um, we have lost that chip, so to speak, in the process of building technologies. And now we need to bring that back into our curricula, whether it's graduate students, undergraduate students, especially in STEM, where we actually emphasize what the scientific method entails and what does it mean to be scientifically um, robust and scientifically, you know, has integrity, so to speak. And this is the critical aspect that we're trying to bring back into our curricula at CMU, so teaching students from the get-go, what does it mean to do solid scientific inter, you know, inquiry? Uh, it's not just about get, chasing the, the latest numbers on a, on a leaderboard, which has actually unfortunately become the, the, the common practice. And we encourage it by publishing these papers, right? So you have an incremental result that may be improved over soda by 0.5%. Have you done statistical significance testing? No. Have you looked at the implications of what it means? Is it really worth it to add maybe several billion parameters just to get 2% improvement? What does that mean actually in practice? So all these kinds of questions are never be really posed. And now I'm starting to think we need to incentivize the publications, uh, you know, like what gets merited as a publication. Um, how do we teach the students? How do we mentor them? But then the professors themselves need to be indoctrinated in a sense to, to actually, you know, uh, encourage this. But again, from industry or people who are hiring. So this was a problem. Part, another part of the reason I went back to academia is I wanted to, I realized we had a gap. People graduate from college since they have this gaps in their, um, in their training, they come in and they, you know, propagate bad practices. So how can we go back to a definition of what good practices are? And basically, again, it's incumbent upon us as academia to set the good practices, so to speak, and create these frameworks so that we can actually, you know, hold people accountable. But we need to do our jobs. So I hope that addresses your question. Sorry if I went too long. Yeah. Thank you very much. Are there uh, any other questions? Yes. Hello, Mana. Hi. I, I want to... To ask you, uh, well, first you mentioned that for a responsible, responsible AI, it's important to have a better, a good uh, problem understanding. So is Say that again. I mentioned what responsible uh, AI has what? I don't know if if, if she. If she let me stop sharing. Let me uh, let me stop sharing, and maybe I can. Would you repeat the question, please? Could, we can hear you. Can you not hear me? You can't hear me? You can't hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I want to ask you if Rafe consider uh -huh. uh, the communication problem between member, members of an uh, interdisciplinary project for a better uh, problem understanding. Yes. So this is a key aspect of the work is essentially diversity and inclusion. And when I say diversity and inclusion, it also includes people from other disciplines. So um, 
And so I, I use this in a very, very wide uh, net kind of casting where diversity and inclusion is not just about, you know, the team makeup or the, the, the ethnicities of the people working on it. So there is this reductionist way of thinking of diversity and inclusion. If I include, you know, people of Egyptian, Mexican, uh, German heritage, then I've, I've done my job. But there's also diversity of inclu and inclusion of ideas, alternative approaches. So now everybody's in this deep learning, you know, self-supervised learning framework of how to do things scientifically. Actually, this is not the only way of doing things, right? So there are alternative ways of thinking about the, the space and being accepting of that. So diversity and inclusion in terms of ideas, in terms of uh, algorithms, in terms of thoughts, in terms of disciplines. So for example, I right now, I'm collaborating with psychologists and anthropologists. I'm also collaborating with uh, lawyers. Um, so, you know, these in the lawyer case, it's really about the subject matter expert in domains, the, um, the believe it or not, the people working on psychology and anthropology, they're in fact affecting how I build my models in the first place, which is something that's really interesting because the way they think about this space and how they actually evaluate has an impact on how we build our models and how we think about the data that goes into our models and how do we do selection of data sets that are actually relevant. So these are all interesting, interesting, um, interesting considerations of diversity and inclusion. So for sure, absolutely, yes, diversity and inclusion includes responsible AI framework. Rave includes diversity and inclusion from that perspective exactly. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, another question? This way. This way. No. Okay. If there are no more questions, uh, yes. Okay, please. Uh, Mona, uh, that's true that for a responsible NLP or sustainable NLP, um, we're going to need to, I mean, you, you just mentioned, uh, and uh, my, my colleague here as well, uh, diverse stakeholders, right? Yes. Um, to advance that, to move forward. Um, however, how can we do that if it's in the same, some, sometimes in the same companies or in the same in, uh, institutions, we see separated groups creating the same technology, but not communicating between them. So how challenging is this? I'm talking, for example, I'm, this this uh, example uh, at, at Meta, um, I think you participated for the creation of o OPG, right? But there are others like Lama, Lama, Lama 2 as well. So how can we advance? How challenging is this to create a framework? responsible NLP framework or responsive or sustainable uh, NLP framework as well. Yeah, this is actually a good point. So in industry, it's sometimes by design that they have competing um, competing teams. Um, and it's not necessarily framed as a competing or as a competition. But I mean, for example, I just, I found out about Llama like everybody else outside of Meta at the time. Um, even though I was in the company at the time, I was the lead responsible AI research scientist. Um, but they did not go through us for Llama verification, the f especially the first initial version when they made, because it was kind of a secret project. Um, and it's by design. I, I, I mean, companies do this to diversify, to make sure that they actually have the best technology out there. So there are some incentives from their perspective. I mean, cost aside, which is kind of crazy when you think about it, OPT alone cost us $5 million in its first iteration when it came out. We had XGLM, XLMG, we had OPT, we had Galactica, we had multiple of these, right? Which And Galacta, for example, also failed because it did not go through uh, us as, a, as an organization. So they decided to release it and literally within two days they took it down. And I found out about it exactly like everybody else, like literally two, like when it came out to the market. So, and that has been acknowledged, right? So the issue is, it's sometimes they're in this frantic mode of trying to produce things as soon as possible. So they get teams, sub teams working on different things and they don't know about each other, which is really not, I don't know. So it's a questionable practice. I, I can't say whether it's from a business sense, does that make sense? Maybe it does, but you have the same thing in Amazon. So when I worked on Lex, we were officially not allowed to talk to Alexa people even though we're, I mean, we used, we were both building conversation AI technologies for different use cases, different end, end, uh, end users and so on. But still, so the fact that <clears throat> they, they do this is really about maximizing their chances of getting, you know, 
the best technology out there. So this is the reason. Now in academia, we have more transparency. So I'm a big fan of openness and transparency. And this is also another reason I went back to academia <laughs> is that we have this like, you know, um, and I'm trying to cultivate in our culture uh, within within LTI, within SCS, within, you know, CMU, that we have this openness. We basically publicize and we even before the the, the technology or the, um, the science is mature, that we actually share. And this comes again top down where we build um, incentive structures to encourage people to share their technologies, share their insights and so on ahead of time ahead of them being fully, you know, mature, fully um, available to get feedback. It sounds, it actually gives us, collaborative science is better science. That's the bottom line. So, you know, if we if we share more information early on, we get more insights early on. And authorship is not an issue, right? So there there is this um, big misconception that, you know, I need to be exclusive about authorship. I'm one of those people who is very permissive around authorship because that's typically the touchy point. Now, the order of who contributed what now that, you know, the practice now in, in our in our papers is for people to write what their contribution has been to the to the paper. And as long as you've contributed some insight, some thought process to the to the paper or some writing or what have you, then you you could be a co-author. But, but it's listed explicitly what your contribution has been. So, you know what? Authorship should not be an impediment towards getting people to collaborate, which has been the practice, unfortunately, so far. So I think an incentive structure around that is not necessary is, is something that I think we need to talk about as a community at large. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mona, for uh, your presentation. Uh, well, uh, I think everyone is very happy with what we have heard. So we thank uh, Professor Mona with an applause. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for hosting me. I appreciate it. I'm sorry I wasn't able to be there in person, but um, hopefully some some other future time. Bye bye. Well, now we have a, a short coffee break, very short if possible, because now we have part of the theme. And then no coffee break now. Okay, then we continue immediately. To <laughs> don't go away. Uh, after that coffee break, it's going to be just. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, so please use this. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry for stealing the coffee break. <laughs> 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 